These past two years have been some of the most difficult in the history of America. All of us in this room have had our lives challenged and changed that just 24 months ago we couldn't have ever imagined. We have found ourselves isolated from our family and friends. Our jobs changed if we were lucky enough to keep them. Our living rooms became classrooms so that our children could keep learning. We did all of that while living in hypervigilance and fear of a disease that we didn't fully understand. As of today, the physical health consequences of COVID-19 has killed nearly one million Americans. Adding to that staggering total are the psychological consequences that you, and you, and you, and you, and I have been dealing with. According to the CDC, 40% of Americans have reported struggling with mental health issues these past two years. A recent study out of Boston University identified that one in three American adults have had symptoms of major depression. That's crazy. Think about that. Our lives have been changed in ways that we just couldn't imagine. Understanding the psychological impacts that COVID-19 has had on our lives is imperative for us to learn how to cope with it. After all, collectively, we've been through adversity before, right? World wars, natural disasters, terrorism, economic collapse. What's so different this time? Now, overcoming the adversities that life throws our way is a phenomenon known as resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience is a uh, often misunderstood concept. Many people believe being resilient is being strong, strong like Superman, right? After all, the man of steel could overcome any obstacle that life threw his way. But if your idea of resilience is Superman, you're incorrect. See, each of us in this room have traits of resilience that make us like these two objects, an egg or a tennis ball. And so when life gets hard, and it will get hard, your girlfriend breaks up with you, you fail anatomy, which is a really hard class, by the way, <laughs> you get fired from a job, your grandparent dies. There's one of two outcomes that happen to us, right? Being resilient isn't being so strong that those things don't happen to us in life. Being resilient is being like this tennis ball, that when they do, we can bounce back. If you were to Google the term resilient, what you would find is several healthcare professionals and academic scholars who have developed extensive lists on how to build this resilience. They'd encourage you to set goals, practice gratitude, meditate, connect with other people. None of those strategies are incorrect. But for me, in my journey in becoming more like this tennis ball, it really started by understanding the concept of delayed gratification. The definition of delayed gratification is literally in the words. It's the ability to wait or resist an immediate result for a better result down the road. It's a rather complex Freudian principle, but I like to explain it to people using music as a metaphor. After all, music's one of those great things in life, meaning it doesn't matter what your opinion on it is, none of us are wrong. But depending on the time period in which you listen to it, it can teach us a whole lot about delayed gratification. Let's go back 50 years to the 1970s. If you wanted to listen to music outside of the radio, you did so through vinyl records. And I got one here, right? The Knack, with the all-time hit, My Sharona. Great song, unfortunately, on a terrible album. <laughs> if you wanted to listen to My Sharona, you first had to listen to songs like Oh Tara, Lucinda, Let Me Out, and, and several other songs. Vinyl taught us that in order to get to the great stuff, sometimes we had to listen to just, just okay stuff, and even, at times, pretty terrible stuff. <laughs> it taught us that life isn't always days full of greatest hits. Now, if we were to fast forward to the 1980s, we introduced the cassette tape, right? No longer did we have to listen to the entire album for our favorite songs. No, we could press down the fast forward button 
And if we wanted to listen to the bosses dancing in the dark, say, 10 straight times, we could do that by holding down the rewind button. It took work, don't get me wrong, but those results, that gratification, came so much faster than it did with vinyl. Now let's skip ahead to the 1990s, where we introduced the compact disc, or CD. No longer did we have to hold down, fast forward, or rewind, but with a push of a button, we could skip to the songs we wanted to listen to and never have to listen to those that we didn't. Those results, that gratification came even faster. But to be fair, we still had to navigate the entire album. Now, if we skip all the way to where we're at today, most of you in this room never owned a cassette tape. Many of you never spent a morning camped outside Sam Goody waiting for a new release CD. No, most of us in this room consume our music digitally. We want to hear a hit song, we simply pull out our phone, we fire up the Spotify app, and within seconds, we get that hit. And we get hit after hit after hit with no interruptions and only the songs we want to hear with very minimal effort, with immediate gratification. That expectation of our music, unfortunately, has bled over into our lives in many instances. That desire for immediate gratification. Now, for me and my story and how I started to understand delayed gratification, we have to go back to the 1990s, where me and my sister were raised by a single mother. Now, my mom did the very best that she could, but much like it is today, being raised by a single mom brings lots of challenges and adversity. Much like the music scene in the 90s, I was a CD guy, meaning I didn't want to listen to the songs I didn't like, and I wanted that immediate gratification with very little work. Well, that CD attitude towards life had me fail the eighth grade. See, I wasn't much into reading, so let's skip the song they call homework. I wasn't much into school, so let's skip all the songs that had to deal with school, and let's just listen to those about video games and having fun. And that's exactly what I did. I skipped more school than I attended in the eighth grade. Now, as you can imagine, that didn't sit well with my mother. I was heading down a very dark path, and it needed to change quickly. So that summer, my mom packed our family up and moved us hundreds of miles away to live with my grandparents on the family farm. Now, this move was a game changer. You see, my grandparents didn't listen to cassette tapes. They didn't even own a CD player. No, my grandparents were old school, like the glory days of vinyl old school. It was on that farm I was introduced to the idea of delayed gratification. Every day, the message of working hard now for a better tomorrow was drilled into my head. My grandparents seized every opportunity to teach me and tell me that if I ever was going to change the direction my life was headed, it would start by learning and appreciating to delay gratification. Now, this was a potential conflict, right? I'm the CD guy. I'm in the 90s, Grandpa, right? I'm not into vinyl records. I'm not listening to those songs I don't want to hear. So there was lots of conflict while we were baling hay and fixing fences, because I wanted it now. But over time, as the years wore on, the message started to sink in, and I started to see the importance of delaying that gratification. I started to appreciate those songs that I historically never wanted to listen to. That newfound appreciation led me to my military service. See, the other thing I failed to mention that I learned by growing up on a farm was that I didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> I'm thankful for those who do, but I was not cut out for that line of work. And I knew that the only way I was ever getting off that farm was to delay the gratification that my friends were enjoying of going to the lakes, getting ready to go to college, to delay that gratification and prepare to join the army. And that's what I did. Now, I went from a young boy who wanted that immediate gratification and skipped school to a young man who started to understand the importance of delayed gratification. That delayed gratification taught me that no matter how difficult things got, it was always working towards something better. And that mantra pushed me through some of the darkest places I've ever been in my life. Without that appreciation for delayed gratification, I don't know where I would be. I might still be that CD guy 
who's looking for fast and easy solutions to all of my problems. And when those fast and easy solutions didn't work, because most of the time they don't, I'd end up like that egg splattered all over this floor. Not only did delayed gratification give me that resilience to push through those difficult times, it gave me those tools that pushed me harder and further than I could have ever imagined. I mean, think about it. I went from failing out of junior high to becoming a college professor and giving you this TED Talk. It's incredible. Now, I'm not suggesting the answer to all the psychological problems caused by COVID-19 will be solved by working on a farm or for us trading in our Spotify apps for a record player. But there is an important message that I want you to hear. As a society, we have lost something. We have lost the ability to embrace those songs that we don't want to listen to. When things get tough, we don't bounce back up. When life throws the worst at us, we become eggs. We fall, we crack, we look for someone or something to put us back together. Overcoming the adversity that life will continue to throw at us requires resilience, resilience within. And my big idea here this morning is that building resilience is delaying gratification. You want to bounce back in life like this tennis ball? You have to learn to appreciate all the songs on the album they call life, not just the hits. Thank you.